Great, thank you. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our discussion on the U.S. midterm elections. My name is John Harper. For a number of years, I was on the resident faculty here, a professor of American foreign policy. My fellow panelists are my colleague, Eric Jones, who is the director of the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies at, at the European University Institute in Florence. He's also a professor of European studies and international political economy here at SICE Europe. And Dr. Veronica Angle, who's an adjunct professor at SICE Europe, as many of you know, and visiting fellow at the Robert Schumann Center. So Eric is gonna start us off with an overview and he has some slides uh, to present the midterms, to give you a, put them in context. Then uh, we'll turn to Veronica, who's going to talk about the possible impact on US-European relations and foreign policy. And then I'm, I'm also gonna focus, I will take 10 minutes or so to, to also talk about the possible implications of these uh, elections for U.S. foreign policy. And then, of course, we'll open it up to your questions. We also have questions, presumably, that will be coming in online. So, Eric, over to you. No, terrific. Thanks, John. Um, I, I should say, right, I'm not a student of American politics. The, the last course I took on American politics was taught by John Harper. Uh, so this is just my long overdue in-class presentation. Uh, and, and, and my goal is, is really as much as possible just to set the stage, right? To give you a sense of what's going on. So if you're American, and particularly if you're an American who's, who's served in the military or worked in the government, um, you probably know an awful lot more than I'm going to reveal, right? But if you're not American, then hopefully some of this will be useful to you, right? And you won't have seen it on YouTube or, or wherever you get your news, uh, get your news lately. Um, now, <clears throat> having said that, um, I think I, I think what we're going to try to do is to bring you into the conversation. So when when Professor Harper talks about you having the opportunity to participate at the end, I really want you to do that, right? Uh, and, and you're also very welcome to make uh, to make arguments as well as ask questions. Um, <clears throat> Now, what I'm going to do uh, is talk a bit about what's new in American politics, why we think this is interesting now. I I'm going to talk about what's going on in the House vote, right? What's going on in the Senate vote. Uh, for those of you who are interested in reproductive rights, we're going to talk about what's going on in the gubernatorial races, because that's actually where the real action uh, is going to be. Uh, and, and then I'm going to end with implications, which means basically hand over, uh, hand over to my colleagues, because they're going to have to tell uh, what this all means, and I'm just going to going to sort of set the table for that. So, what's new? Uh, I think the the reason that we're focusing on these midterm elections uh, is that there's just an incredible polarization in American politics. It's something that's been developing uh, since 1992, I would argue, uh, and it expresses itself in in very powerful forms of self sorting. It's very difficult to find Americans who live in proximity to other Americans who do not share their political beliefs. Uh, this is true both in the macro picture. So what I've done is put uh, put the actual uh, results from the last uh, congressional elections. Um, <clears throat> and, and what you can see is that there are obviously big places that are red, uh, right? And small places that are blue. It's just that the small places that are blue, for those of you who are not American, right? Red is right and blue is left, right? I know it's very confusing from a European context, but, um, but, <clears throat> but, but those blue places are small, but there are lots of people who live there, right? Uh, and, and so it's really an urban rural divide. Um, I come from Texas and I think Texas is the most important place on earth. So I thought I would, I would highlight the, the great state of Texas. And what you see is most of it is painted red, except for these little dots, right? Of blue, Dallas and Houston, right? Austin as well, but, but, but Austin's red in a different way. Uh, and, and so, so when you, when you look at this, um, what you have to ask yourself is, does everybody in Dallas vote Democrat? And the answer is, Obviously not, right? If you go and look at the map of Dallas and they've drilled down into households, uh, what you see is that the reds and the blues don't mix even in these urban environments, right? So there's literally no mixing in American politics. You would not have a conversation with someone who disagrees with you if you could avoid it. And if you don't live anywhere near them, you can, okay? That's new. Um, <clears throat> 
The other thing uh, that's new is spending, right? Despite the fact that nobody lives around anybody who disagrees with them, they're spending shocking amounts on these midterms. These are midterms, and they're spending over $9 billion to contest these elections, right? Um, and, and most of that money, believe it or not, because I just talked to you about YouTube, is being spent on television advertising, uh, which is why I put the, the Nielsen media markets up. What you should see is that the media markets and congressional districts have nothing to do with one another. And so these poor congressional candidates, even if they have really big districts, are often spending across multiple media markets, and it's costing them the earth. Uh, and, and the reason that the spending is important is because the spending can only come from people who have that kind of money. And the people who have that kind of money are actually the people who are investing in the polarization that I talked about earlier, right? So, so the fact that it's expensive and the fact that it's polarized has created this self-reinforcing dynamic in American politics that we find very difficult to escape from. And, and, and that, I think, is important to understand in the context uh, of these elections. But well, that's new. Um, what's not new? Uh, what's not new is that that people who get elected to Congress very rarely lose their seats, right? Uh, and 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 so we're talking about a, a fringe of the House that's going to turn over. Probably about twenty five seats will turn over. That's enough to swing the majority. Uh, and and you know what? That was baked in all along, right? Because the House always moves in the midterms. Uh, and so if you were to look at the 538 polling, um, what you would see is that, that there was some tightening up, right? But it was never even close like the Democrats were going to retain control. If you read in the newspapers that the Democrats were going to retain control, uh, that's because the newspapers wanted you to buy the newspaper, uh, but, but not because that's what was really going to happen on the ground. On the ground, we know we're going to lose control in the House. Uh, and, and then the only big question is when we lose control in the House and of all those committees, uh, what is the new committee leaders going to do, right? Uh, and, and, and I think we can speculate about that uh, and, and probably very close to right. Uh, but, but hey, let's face it, um, we're going to find out soon enough. Right. Um, <clears throat> the interesting thing is, is that the toss ups uh, are not all that many in number. Uh, and even in those toss up districts, unless somebody is not returning as an incumbent, uh, the incumbent is more likely to win uh, than to lose. Um, Having said that, there is some variation across polling organizations. So I put up a variety of different polls to show you that there is something to talk about. In, in the political risk consultancy uh, with which I work, uh, the guys who follow American politics follow this obsessively at a district by district level because it will have an impact on policy, who gets in, and it will give us some sense of what's going to happen two years from now when we have another presidential election. Uh, but, but the point I would emphasize is, is even though there's variation across polling organizations, that variation doesn't really affect the outcome uh, as a whole, right? It, it's, we're still going to lose control. We, the Democrats, are still going to lose control of the House. I didn't mean to just give away my political identification, but since I work in an ivory tower, you probably guessed that anyway. Um, the, the Senate is interesting because the Senate is closer, right? Um, and, and, and that's not just because uh, it's 50-50 right now, but it's also because when you get to the Senate level, you're aggregating votes at a statewide level. And, and across states, there are real debates underway. And, and what you can see are the probabilities uh, that, that it's going to go uh, either Republican or, or remain Democrat. And, and those probabilities are pretty even. Um, my colleagues, again, in the political risk consultancy were, were all excited to report that it had shifted from 50-50 to 51-49, not in terms of the seat outcome, but in terms of the probability of seizing control. At, at which point I'm like, you know, what is the standard error in these estimates, right? Because if the standard error is three, then it hasn't shifted at all, right? Uh, and, and in fact, I would argue uh, that's where we are. Um, there are Senate seats to watch. And what you can notice, the common factor is the Senate seats to watch are those where either the incumbent is not running again, or the incumbent has only one term under their belt, right? Uh, and, and so as long as you pay attention to that, there are very few exceptions to that rule. There are also great candidates to watch because they're so weird, right? Uh, and, and they're weird on both sides. Uh, so if, if you were never interested in Pennsylvania politics, you should be now. Um, <clears throat> but but I'm not sure I'm, I'm I'm not sure that we can really read into these tea leaves any more uh, than we've seen at the statistical level. It's a dead heat, right? Um, if the Democrats retain control of the Senate and the Republicans get control of the House, that will have one set of impacts 
uh, if the Democrats lose control over both chambers, we'll have a second different set of impacts, right? Uh, something to, to watch out for. Um, the, the gubernatorial races are interesting because state politics has suddenly become more important. Uh, state politics is where the battle for reproductive rights is going to be fought. Uh, and, and, and what you can see is that some governors actually may change. Unfortunately, the, the governors that you that you might want to see change, right, like, like Abbott in Texas, uh, are not going to change. Right, you know, Beto O'Rourke is the most attractive candidate and always will be. Uh, but but he's he's never gonna never gonna get elected office at a statewide level in Texas because Texas has got these large rural districts where he simply cannot compete. Right, and and where the Republicans will receive Stalin-esque majorities of of ninety five percent of the local vote. Right, so so it's, you know you can do all you want in Houston and Dallas, uh, but but it, that don't make a difference. Uh, if they're getting 95% of the vote uh, out in Abilene. Um, and, <clears throat> and, and as the governors uh, change, one thing to bear in mind is that not all states are contested, right? So we're not going to see a huge sweep, uh, but we are going to see a drift to the right. And it's interesting, this drift to the right, precisely because you would have expected something different, given the debate about reproductive rights and the implications uh, that this will have in, in that debate. Um, <clears throat> I've, I've put this, uh, this stuff up um, because there's also Stacey Abrams in Georgia, who's very attractive uh, as a Democratic candidate, and yet, for whatever reason, is unable to move the needle. Uh, you can have really attractive Democratic candidates in these states uh, and still not actually get a change in the result. And I think that's important for us to bear in mind, uh, because the polarization really bakes a lot of the politics into the mix, right? So that means that although some governors will change, um, not, not those that have the biggest uh, the biggest uh, <clears throat> contestants going against them. So what are the implications of all this? Well, I don't know, right? Um, I can I can speculate, uh, which is what I said, uh, but, but I'm gonna hand over to my colleagues uh, to give you the implications. Uh, all, all I can say is that, that we are gonna see a change uh, on the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November uh, in terms of who controls these houses, that change will actually take effect institutionally uh, come January. Uh, and, and then we're gonna have to see what the last two years of Biden's presidency uh, look like a after that. Anyway, John, back, back to you. Thank you, Eric. Did you say Texas is the most important state in the union? We, we, I, I mean, <laughs> come on, Texas is- France I'm from Pennsylvania, by the way, which is the most important state in these elections. I can tell you that. Anyway, I think we're gonna we're gonna hand it over to you, Veronica. In the meantime, all of you can be thinking about what the implications are, and then you can at least. Tell us what you think they will be, and then we can we can debate it. Hi, everyone. I'm going to stand so you can have a more direct view of the slides um, that I've been uh, uh, working on for um, uh, for a day or so, because I really wanted to update some of the polling that I'm going to show you um, and make sure that I have the, the, the latest. And um, yeah, thanks for no pressure there. What are the implications? Uh, as, um, as, as Professor Harper mentioned, uh, I am a lecturer in risk in international politics and economics uh, here at SAIS. So whether I want it or not, it's part of my job to tell you what the implications are, even if the questions are quite, um, quite uh, wide and, and broad. So I chose some of them that I think are the most important questions that we need to focus on. Uh, for the time being, at least. Um, and these uh, relate to the you know, likely Republican takeover um, of the House and what are uh, the implications of a uh, Republican takeover of the House. Will the Republicans drift away from supporting NATO? Will Congress be less supportive of Ukraine? Um, is U.S. support for democracy promotion abroad weakening? It's not that high to begin with, but is it weakening? Will U.S. domestic issues overshadow international commitments? Um, and is U.S. grown political violence becoming an international problem? Uh, so these are all very happy thoughts to start off with. But the things don't actually look that bad because... 
Let's think about support for NATO. We all know that the Republicans are traditionally very supportive of everything that has to do with military and uh, the uh, U.S. presence uh, abroad. And I've pulled out some numbers from the vote roll calls, both historically and uh, more present, um, of how the uh, support for NATO has been distributed within the Senate. And one important proxy for this is how both Republicans and Democrats have voted when it came uh, to uh, decide on uh, NATO enlargement. So the most debated one to begin with, starting in November 1998, this was Clinton administration with a uh, Republican controlled Congress, and you could still see um, that uh, the um, there was some, you know, not full support uh, from uh, from the from the re uh, Republicans for this. But um, yeah, there were the, the distribution was not that that high. If you look at the debates within, uh, or the differences were not that high. And if you look at the debates um, in the Senate at the time, the worries that they had were mostly about Russia. Uh, uh, feeling threatened. So unlike what some of the luminaries of international relations might say today, there was always a concern uh, for what, uh, for how Russia will perceive NATO enlargement towards the East. Um, and that was what overshadowed full support uh, for enlargement towards the, um, towards Poland, uh, Czech Republic, the Czech Republic and Hungary. There was absolutely no debate when the sec for the second NATO enlargement after the fall of communism, uh, when NATO enlarged to seven more Central and Eastern European countries. Uh, Russia was not part of that conversation at this time. It was quite a weak power um, and it didn't matter that much. Again, Republicans and Democrats supported NATO enlargement. And even when NATO um, enlarged to include Montenegro, there wasn't really a big Republican, um, a big Republican system there. But let's see what happens now, right? So if now when NATO enlarged to include Sweden and Finland, and the Senate had to vote on that, again, um, there wasn't there wasn't uh, a m much to contest, uh, and and it seemed that both Republicans and Democrats were on board with NATO enlargement, even at a fraught time um, in international politics. The nay and the Republican, I don't remember who uh, that person was, um, but I do. Um, uh, sorry, they confused the buttons. I'm not sure, um, but <laughs> I do remember that. Um, uh, Senator Paul did say that um, uh, the um, uh, U.S. overextended its, um, you know, the libertarian uh, uh, view that the U.S. is way too present in the East. Uh, but that's an exception, right? And um, they think this is important to keep in mind because we have a lot of bad news coming from all over the place. But it doesn't particularly seem that when it comes to NATO support, we have uh, a big problem going forward. And we can see that in the support that the U.S. has been delivering to Ukraine. Uh, it does seem that the support towards Ukraine is not eroding for the time being. The U.S. keeps leading the Western coalition against Russia. There are a bunch of people in this Western coalition, just to refer to it in, in broad um, labels. Um, there are There's some talk that there sh we should start a negotiation with Russia on behalf of Ukraine, uh, but so far uh, the U.S. is staying the course on, on current strategy not to negotiate with Russia. At the same time, we already hear a lot from the State Department and from uh, uh, leaders of uh, different areas of U.S. foreign policy that the lines of communication between U.S. and Russia are anyway uh, at, at the weakest uh, that they've been in a very long time. So those, uh, the possibility to even start a communication with Russia um, is not an easy thing to do. We also have to keep in mind that Ukraine has received $41 uh, billion in military aid uh, in 2022, and that is 80% of what entire, the entire defense budget of Russia, right? And it's nothing for the U.S., so as long as there is political support to the idea that it doesn't mean that much economically for the U.S., uh, we are likely to see this uh, continue. And 
Nevertheless, you will see some things in the news that you have to decide for yourself, whether it's more signal or noise. There is some disappointment of where some of the uh, weapons uh, that end up in Ukraine are ending up. Um, and uh, you have U.S. troops on the ground right now and a little more oversight to make sure that any illicit traffic of weapons um, uh, is being uh, held under control. Support for NATO and Ukraine implicitly has also been um, contested um, in, uh, in, in the House, but in the end, when uh, you had important bills coming uh, to the vote, uh, it does seem that although some Republicans have been against important things, not all of them uh, have, uh, have polarized, right? So this is not a, that much of a polarizing issue as other issues that we have seen. If you remember, at some point there was this president called Donald Trump, who unfortunately cannot go away, uh, and we still see him around, uh, who had, who made these past comments of the possibility of the U.S. withdrawing support for NATO, which was a big, uh, big problem for everyone in 2019. And at that point, uh, the House actually voted um, on a bill uh, with um, bipartisan support to prohibit U.S. withdrawal of funds from NATO. Um, and there were 22 Republicans who uh, uh, who voted against, but there were 149 who did not stick with um, uh, President Trump's rhetoric. This changed a bit uh, when the House had to vote recently after Russia's invasion of Ukraine um, in a bill that called for more support for NATO in March of 2022, uh, where the Republicans voted more numerously against, um, against providing this support for NATO. And um, that is important to, to note, right? Because you could see that there is a shift there in the Republican uh, support uh, for both NATO and Ukraine. But it's important to look at what these different bills actually refer to. And this is where I transition towards the likelihood for more or less support, less support for democracy promotion abroad. The first bill I refer to in from 2019 had very clear objectives, right? The president shall not withdraw the United States from NATO and no funds are authorized to be appropriated, obligated or uh, expanded to take any action to withdraw the United States from NATO. So it was something that they could get on board with. The actual, the bill of 2022 had a different kind of verbiage um, and it did lean a lot into this idea of democracy promotion uh, that President Biden included in his campaign um, and that he has been trying to use to uh, um, polarize more the society in a, a democracy versus authoritarian camp. So it did say that NATO should uphold the funding democratic principles um, and to use the voice and vote of the United States to establish a center for democratic resilience uh, within NATO headquarters. So what Republicans found problematic here wasn't actually you know, support for Ukraine um, uh, itself, but the fact that they may have you know, lended their vote to something that was part of a rhetoric that their party doesn't actually su uh, support for the time being. So we, can ask ourselves, right, is democracy promotion still part of the U.S. Uh, toolbox um, of, of um, presence in international uh, relations? And um, it doesn't seem to be the case. If you look at the trends on most important issues that are dividing Democrats and Republicans uh, for these elections. Um, and I've pulled some of this um, um, information here from, from polling, from the latest polling. You can see that the domestic issues prevail. Again, this is not surprising. Uh, it will probably be difficult to see, uh, but for Republicans and Democrats, the economy is the most important thing that they um, they're focusing on, um, and then there are some, there is some variation for the Republicans. There is no actual care for you know coronavirus, but this is higher for Democrats, um, and uh, you would see that as you would expect, Republicans are more interested in issues related to uh, immigration, um, um, while the Democrats are more interested in other things related to 
um, to abortion or, or gun policy. Nobody cares that much anymore about the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Sure, we can see it here mentioned, but it doesn't really go very high uh, among, um, among the issues that people are concerned with. And this is important, right? Democracy, although the Democrats have tried to make it a thing, it did not turn into a thing for these elections. Not even when you look at Google Trends, right? So maybe there was some social desirability there when people are answering poll questions. But if you look at what actually people are Googling, according to the methodology that um, um, we can, uh, that Google has set up in its trends, we can see that the political topics in swing states like Pennsylvania or Georgia um, mostly uh, revolve around wages and social security. Um, and it's not, again, about um, anything that is internationally related or that has to do with democracy. I need a bit of water. <laughs> to talk to cover all this. Okay. That wasn't very classic, but very efficient. So not even when we look at this, do we see that there's any interest in, um, in, in democracy promotion. We can also see that the issues that Democrats are banking on are not the most pressing issues. So even if the two parties seem to be speaking across each other, so they're not engaging on debating um, uh, the economy, for example, um, they do they are associated with different issues as and in, in terms of um, effectiveness. Um, however, the issues that most people care about are the issues that the Republicans are associated with. So 60% of, of people who are polled by this public opinion strategies poll would want Republicans to handle jobs and the economy. Obviously, 90% of voters would prefer Republican control of Congress for the issue of immigration and border. Um, so there isn't, um, um, there, there's a, definitely a correlation between what are the most relevant issues for voters and who is actually running on those issues, right? Climate, again, is not a major issue for people either. Uh, so the last point was related to the deep, divisive, disturbing, and continuing uh, polarization in, in U.S. society. Although we can see that when it comes to support for NATO or Ukraine and so on, uh, we may not see a lot of variation going forward, but it will be more difficult uh, to, uh, to deal with, uh, with a divided Congress for political um, reasons. And that is also because of the uh, deep increase in violent um, um, attitudes that um, are now going beyond merely a mix of right-wing organizations. So this is not about the Oath Keepers. This is not about Proud Boys anymore. Um, there, are, there are numerous studies that are coming out of University of Chicago, which I encourage you to look into uh, on what drives um, uh, the millions that actually believe that the 2020 elections were stolen and that force is justified to restore Trump uh, to the presidency. There are millions of Americans who are ready to, um, to engage with that possibility. Um, and that also means that there's a, an important amount of risk going forward uh, to see large mobilizations uh, to, uh, re to replay this stolen election violence in the 2022 primaries and after the midterm elections. And one final point that I want to make here is that we know now what was the, the what is the makeup of the uh, 21 million people uh, who um, who do believe that there is a justification for the use of force to restore Trump in the presidency. Uh, this is very much racially motivated. Uh, and it's the idea that great replacement um, uh, of the great replacement that will take place um, if um, the Democrat party will push its um, electorate um, to, to take over. And also there is an important um, influence from the QAnon cult uh, that we do not talk about <laughs> in sufficiently serious terms because of the kind of conspiracy, crazy conspiracy that they are peddling. 
um, but we do have to take them more seriously because this is a political movement that is growing um, and, um, and we do not have the tools at hand right now uh, to deal with it going forward. Okay, so I'm gonna leave it to that and we can take up more questions. Thank you very much, Veronica. Okay, so over to me. And I'm going to talk about, I don't have any slides, but I have a prediction. <clears throat> and it has to do with foreign policy. That is that if, as it seems likely, the Democrats lose these elections, they lose at least one of the houses of Congress, then uh, President Biden is likely to focus an increasing amount of time, maybe even the lion's share of his time and attention on foreign policy in the next two years, on achieving some kind of major success or more successes in that realm. And the reasons for this are pretty obvious. There will be no more major pieces of legislation passed by the Democrats, uh, such as the American Rescue Plan, uh, the recent Inflation Reduction Act, uh, which were passed with Democratic votes alone. You, know, you may see legislation passed with bipartisan support, you, such as the infrastructure bill, such as the recent CHIPS bill, which is going to spend, um, commit $280 billion to the development of the microchip industry in the United States and, and microchip uh, research and development. But the season of domestic reform that Biden made so much of will be at an end. And if Biden is planning to run again in 2024, and all signs suggest that he is, people close to him say that he has no plans not to run, although the, these elections may affect that calculation, of course. But if he is planning to run, uh, he won't have much choice except to try to produce results in the realm where he will have some margin for maneuver as president, namely the realm of foreign policy. Uh, the same is true if he decides not to run for, for re-election in 2024. He's still going to want to focus, as all presidents do, on his legacy, on consolidating uh, his historical reputation. And there are a number of examples here that come to mind. Ronald Reagan, after the Republican defeat in 1986, focused almost exclusively on arms control with the Soviet Union. Uh, Bill Clinton, after the Democratic defeat in 1994, turned his attention to the Balkans, to the Bosnia Civil War, <clears throat> and also began the process of NATO enlargement, uh, which, uh, by the way, some would argue set in motion the events which have led to the present situation. Um, Barack Obama, after the Democratic defeat in 2014, focused on the Iran nuclear deal and on normalization of relations with Cuba. So there's a clear pattern here. So where could Biden, where can Biden possibly, if you look at the world today, the situation doesn't look very promising, where can Biden possibly hope to achieve foreign policy success in the next two years? And I think unavoidably, he's going to focus on ending the war in Ukraine, raising the question as to how that war is likely to end. Well, wars end either through a decisive victory for one side, allowing it to impose its will on the other, or else they end through a compromise, a negotiated compromise settlement. Now, whatever chance Russia had to win a decisive victory has long since disappeared. But I don't think Ukraine is likely to win a decisive victory either. If that, if by decisive victory, you mean expelling Russia altogether from the Donbass and, and Crimea, that seems unlikely to me. I think the war is more likely to end through a Korea type armistice that would be at best a partial victory for Ukraine because it would leave Crimea and possibly parts of the Donbass in Russian hands. Now, if you factor in the, the Republican victory in these elections, I it seems to me that likely that outcome becomes even more likely than it already is. Um, some of Republicans, centrist Republicans, Mitch McConnell, are insisting <clears throat> that the Republican victory will, will not affect U.S. 
policy toward Ukraine. It will not affect U.S. support for Ukraine. Uh, but I think it will. I think it will affect it. Uh, things are not going to change overnight, obviously. Uh, but I think concern about the cost of the war to the U.S. taxpayer will increase. I think political pressure to attach strings to U.S. military aid to Ukraine will increase. I think pressure to seek a negotiated end to the war will increase. The, the simple fact is that there's less support in the Republican Party at the base of the Republican Party for helping Ukraine than there is among Democrats. And there are a number of polls <clears throat> which show this. A, a morning consult poll from three weeks ago found that only 32% of Republicans believe that the United States has a responsibility to help Ukraine, whereas 58% of Democrats do. That's not an overwhelming number of Democrats either, by the way. But there's definitely a difference here. Uh, as I think was mentioned, the Kevin McCarthy, Representative Kevin McCarthy, who's likely to be the new Speaker of the House, has said that the Republicans will not be giving a blank check to Ukraine. Now, he has qualified that statement. Other Republicans have contradicted him. But that is that, that does not change the facts on the ground in the Republican Party, that there's less support for Ukraine. The official position of the Biden administration now is that it's up to President Zelensky to decide if there will be negotiations and what will and will not be negotiated. And now that's understandable. Uh, it's not, by the way, that is also the official position, more or less, of the German and the French governments. And it's understandable that that is the official position, that it's up to Zelensky, especially when the momentum of the fighting favors Ukraine, as it does at the moment. But I doubt if that is somehow, if that is the real position of the U.S. government, and certainly of the German and French governments. If it is the real position, I think that's going to change. You can't rule out, of course, a Russian military collapse. If you know the history of the First World War, there was a famous battle called Caporetto, where the Italian army collapsed. That could happen. That could happen. Uh, but it seems more likely that the Ukrainian momentum of the moment on the ground will slow, that the Russians will manage to hold on to what they have, perhaps a line corresponding to the, uh, the line uh, where the war began, and you'll have a stalemate. They'll have a military stalemate. A military stalemate on the ground will reinforce the political pressure within the U.S. and Western Europe to pursue a, no a negotiated end to the war, and it will push the Biden administration uh, to push Ukraine to accept a compromise. The situation will then recall what Georges Clemenceau, the Prime Minister of France, during the First World, world War. Do you remember his famous remark about war? He said, war is, too, is something too important, trop grave, to, to leave to the generals. To, to decide. And I think the Biden administration's position will be that war with Russia, when and how it comes to an end, is too serious a thing to leave to the Ukrainians alone to decide. And of course, there will have to be a generous package of aid. There will have to be generous incentives for Ukraine to accept a compromise. Um, but at the end of the day, he who pays the piper calls the tune. Another possibility for Biden, getting back to what he might do in the realm of foreign policy, as unlikely as it may seem at the moment, would be to try to have a significant detente with China. And I say unlikely. It is unlikely, certainly at the moment, uh, because Biden has taken a very hard line with China. He's taken a surprisingly hard line, China. He has, he and his, the Democrats have moved away from the policy of strategic ambiguity on Taiwan toward an outright military alliance with Taiwan. Uh, two weeks ago, you may have been following this. I hope you are, because it's very important. It's a very important issue. 
Two weeks ago, the administration announced a set of unilateral US export controls and other restrictions on semiconductors and semiconductor manufacturing equipment designed to contain, if not to kill, China's advanced semiconductor industry and to permanently confine China to a level in the area, the crucial area of semiconductor production way below that of the United States, say to keep it permanently 10 years behind the United States. You have to ask yourself what the administration is really thinking here. What is the end game? They haven't said what the end game is, if they themselves know what the end game is. But from a Chinese perspective, it would certainly be perfectly understandable to conclude that the Biden administration is thinking, well, the United States forced the Soviet system to its knees. We're going to do the same with the Chinese system. In other words, the end game is regime change. And it seems to me you have to ask yourself whether that is a wise message to be sending, either deliberately or inadvertently, at a time when it seems to me the United States should be making an effort to, to try to split China from Russia. Again, it seems un, unlikely at the moment, but is there any reason to think Biden might change course on China, pursue a relaxation of tensions with China? I, well, I think one reason is that the hard line that he has adopted on China is partly a reading of the mistakes that Obama made initially. Obama was initially very conciliatory towards China. The Chinese seem to have taken advantage of that. Biden was forced, Obama was forced to reverse course, <laughs> excuse me, with his famous uh, pivot to Asia in 2011. So it's possible that Biden will decide that his initial hard line has served the purpose of restoring deterrence on Taiwan and risks going too far in the other direction. It's possible he'll see that his microchip policy will have sig significant costs. <clears throat> I'm no expert on this, but I've been trying to follow it and experts suggest that it will have significant costs for US consumers, US companies, as well as uh, non-US companies, Western companies, Japanese, South Korean, uh, Dutch companies. <laughs> and that China also, that China has ways of counteracting US policy. You know, outright theft, of course, uh, doubling down on their own efforts, retaliating against the United States and its allies in other areas, such as rare earth minerals and so on. It's possible Biden will see that accelerated economic decoupling and economic war, because that's what we're talking about here. Accelerated economic decoupling and economic war against China is more likely to, to lead to real war than it is to Chinese surrender or regime change, and that the U.S. should aim for a commercial modus vivendi or series of commercial agreements with China. By the way, that was really what the, the Trump administration was aiming at. The Trump administration, as chaotic as it may seem, was taking a more pragmatic and transactional approach uh, in economic policy towards China. It seems to me the Biden administration is taking a more ideological approach a more absolutist approach. It doesn't seem to be any end game where you buy, you will have negotiations and call an end to this war. Maybe that's in the back of their minds, but it's not evident at the moment that it is. Whereas it was obvious in the case of, Trump, of the Trump administration, there were negotiations. It's possible Biden may see there are, <clears throat> there are concrete benefits from seeking detente with China cooperation on climate change. Certainly there would be concrete benefits for the rest of the world since 40% of CO2 emissions are, are Chinese or American. Uh, distancing China from Russia is another possible benefit. And certainly avoiding war would be the most important benefit of all. And they may even see, Biden may even see finally, as I suggested, that there are domestic political benefits as well to seeking a relaxation of tension with China. So all of this is in the realm of speculation, uh, no doubt of wishful thinking on my part. And I'm in, a, I'm in a distinct minority in suggesting that it might be possible, uh, but we shall see. Okay, so that's 
it's now over to you. And we can, we've talked, actually we've talked more than I had anticipated about the implication for foreign policy. We've, we, we can certainly talk about uh, uh, the, impl impl the implications for American democracy and the American political system, if you'd like to focus a bit more on that. But shall we open it up to your questions? If you have a question or comment, please, as usual, identify yourself and where you're from. Don't be shy. Right here. By the way, do we have a microphone here? I guess we don't. <clears throat> anyway, go ahead. You were. No, I think in the case of Biden's, where his attention will be focused, I think you'll see a pretty rapid shift. I mean, he will still be president. He'll, he'll be facing a Republican-controlled Congress, but he's going to be president for two more years. So I think starting in 2023, I think you'll see the fo focus on on uh, dealing with the, the Ukraine war. I don't think there'll be much of a time lag there. May I? Sure. Because um, I don't disagree with with um, much what uh, Professor Harper said, but it's good that we have a little bit of controversy. Um, I can't imagine a political consultant um, suggesting to Biden to shift towards uh, uh, focusing on political uh, on international issues, given that the majority of the electorate is focusing on domestic issues. So. Although the outcome might be the same, which is trying to negotiate more on Ukraine rather than supporting Ukraine fully towards a, um, a you know, full scale victory, whatever that would be, um, it's, it's not likely that it will come because of an interest in international politics, but rather because the domestic issues are taking priority and they're likely to do so uh, before the, um, the, the elections, the presidential elections. But I think, you know, the, the fact is, when it comes to domestic legislation, at least, he's going to be totally sandbagged. He, he's not going to, he's going to be, his hands are going to be tied. I mean, he has a certain, um, he has a certain margin for maneuver in domestic policy as well. Uh, but I think, you know, let's wait and see where he, where he spends his time, his effort, what his priorities are. On verra. I see Nina and Nina Hall in the back there. So, <clears throat> Nina, I think this is a really excellent question, um, and it's an excellent question because it reveals the difficulty of doing climate action in the United States. The Inflation Reduction Act is the most ambitious piece of climate legislation that any administration has ever put before Congress, and certainly that any admin administration has ever got through Congress. It's just not called climate action because climate action doesn't move the needle in the domestic conversation. So, so I think that, that there will be a lot of climate action. It'll take place, unfortunately, through executive order. Uh, and, and the reason that I say, unfortunately, through executive order is because climate action is something that you actually need to bake in to institutions to ensure that it has a lasting effect. And, and the executive orders that he will be forced to use to pursue the climate agenda 
are, are executive orders that can be overturned on day one uh, of, <coughs> of uh, subsequent administration. So, so I think there will be climate action. I think there has been climate action. Um, I, I think though that in, in, I think this is where your question about COP27 is coming from. Uh, I think that even though I characterize this as revolutionary, the fact is that it's all way too timid uh, given the thermodynamics of the situation. We're going to blow through 1.5. Uh, we're probably going to blow through two degrees. Uh, if we blow through an average two degrees temperature increase at a global level, um, then you can only imagine what life is going to be like at the equator where the variation is four times that. Um, so so I think I think we have to be attentive to the fact that even the very ambitious uh, legislation that the Biden administration has put forward is nothing compared to what's required. And that's before we begin to talk about the investment that would need to be made in climate action in the global South, where there's either, neither the capital uh, nor the technology uh, nor the growth model to, to achieve lasting change, right? So we've got we've just got so much to do, not to, to pour more disappointment on the conversation. We've just got so much to do that we're not even moving the needle on, right? And unfortunately, it's not going to happen in Egypt either. Yeah, well, Hans, I mean, what can I say? It, it, my, and I, I tried to phrase it so that it sounded like what I was suggesting was more in the realm of wishful thinking than it is in the realm of probability. Uh, it's something I would like to see happen, and I think it would be in U.S. interest to happen. But uh, you're right, it takes two to tango. Um, are the Chinese, would the Chinese be ready to tango? Well, you don't know until you try, do you? I mean, this administration has has been uh, nothing but ratcheting up, has done little but ratchet up pressure on China, uh, including Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, for example, which was a, the Biden administration was actually unhappy about, uh, but they they didn't dare to put they didn't dare to tell her not to do it. Uh, so I think. There could be, you could see, and you're, you're also right about the, the risks of getting into a who's tougher on China uh, contest between the two parties. So it, 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 is, it is improbable, uh, but not, not out of the question. I, sus I think the Chinese would see an interest in this. Um, if the United States offered them, you know, even going back to a, a more transactional pragmatic approach, uh, you know, negotiations which conceivably could reach an agreement. Because what, what you really need to do is you have to find a way to allow these systems to coexist. I mean, they're not going to abandon a state-centered system. We're not going to abandon our system either. But, you know, somehow it's not beyond the wit of man, it seems to me, to find a way of converging and reaching agreements uh, on these sectors. It's very complicated. Uh, but I think that was the vision of the uh, of someone like Robert Lighthizer. Does that ring a bell to you, Robert Lighthizer? 
who was the USTR on in the Trump administration. Um, so I don't know, and I think I think Germany will have something to say about this, perhaps as well. I mean, because Germany's Germany's position, even as we speak, Olaf Scholz is on a plane flying to Beijing. If I'm not mistaken, he's going to be there tomorrow with a large delegation of German businessmen, and uh, I think U.S. allies may be able to exercise some uh, a restraining influence on the United States or nudge the United States toward uh, a somewhat more a conciliatory position. You know, I know that the that's not what the Greens want. That I know there's a division. Did it? Did do you read the Financial Times? There's a there's a fascinating article in yesterday's paper about the, the split in Germany over uh, China policy on the on the eve of Schultz's uh, trip to to uh, Beijing. Anyway, we'll see. On the domestic issue, yeah. maybe. Um, so right now it would seem um, that Biden has tried to focus on um, on creating this division between supporters of democracy versus supporters of authoritarianism. Um, and there's an important proxy um, to um, election outcomes and the likely political violence that we will see coming out in the next two years, uh, who is going to win these contested um, um, elections uh, where you have actual people who are present uh, for uh, January sec uh, 6th insurrection. Um, um, and, and they are also likely to, uh, to win. And uh, the problem is, or the challenge for the Democrats and for Biden is that this isn't gaining a lot of traction. So I don't anticipate that the uh, the, the 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 issue of democracy versus autocracy or the the challenges to U.S. democracy um, are is going to fade away for the elections. Uh, but if they don't invest more in a conversation on the economy, um, it's very unlikely that they will. Uh, they will succeed uh, to move the needle a little bit outside of their base. So the base will be targeted with climate, with gun control, uh, with uh, reproductive rights. Of course, democracy uh, is a big issue, uh, but they will have to do much more on the um, uh, on controlling the narrative on the economy because it's very unlikely uh, that the trends and preferences in, in the voters are going to change uh, for the foreseeable future. So obviously my question is, how valid are these polls and can you really predict the future? So I remember sitting on a panel uh, that was hosted by a big insurance company, and there were a bunch of us that were impaneled, and we all said the same thing, which is that, that you know, the polls say that it's very unlikely a one in three chance uh, that, that Donald Trump can win, right? Um, <clears throat> by the way, one in three chance is not the kind of odds I would use on an airplane. If you told me there was a one in three chance that the airplane was going to go down, I wouldn't get on it. So, I mean, the fact that he won doesn't mean that the polls were wrong. It, it just means that it was one in three. Um, having said that, the, the, the thing that I underscored then and would underscore now is that there had been this consistent run of polling that, that said that Trump was a no-hope candidate in 2016, um, but but there was about 46% of the population of the United States that was gonna vote for him nonetheless. And that was the important thing, right? Not predicting that Trump was gonna win or not, uh, but, but identifying the fact that there were these people who were committed to a political program and to a candidate that seems so much at odds with the history of the party or, or the political system in which that was embedded. And I think that was the important message to take away. So when, when Veronica puts up these slides about 25 million people who believe that the 2020 elections were unfairly adjudicated and should be overturned by force, 25 million people, right? That's almost as big as the state of Texas. So that's like a big deal. And, and when you think about it, 
Um, the fact is, is that this is directly translating into real political violence from 2016 uh, to today, if you listen to the latest episode of The Daily on the New York Times, um, the, the incidents of threats against sitting members of Congress have increased tenfold. Uh, the 538 members of Congress are now receiving over 10,000 threats to their well-being a year. This is unbelievable. And, and, and the fact that Nancy Pelosi's husband uh, was was beaten up by a crazy guy who got into her house in the middle of the night spouting QAnon theories is not, I would underscore, not an aberration. It is a symptom of a growing problem in American society that we need to pay attention to. It's not just in American society. You can see it other places too. But the fact that it is in American society and that Americans are heavily armed. I happen to be one of those people that when my parents retired, I went to go clean out the gun closet from the 35 guns that we had in there, right? So I'm not think, saying that owning guns is a bad thing. I thought it was a lot of fun, but the fact that everybody's so heavily armed uh, makes that situation particularly dangerous in, in the United States. 25 million heavily armed people who believe that they should try to fight back against the stealing of an election, that's scary, right? Uh, and, and so to Hans's question about what this means for 2024, the fact of the matter is, after these midterm elections, the polarization that I described is only going to be deeper, right? Well, not only that, policy uh, and, and promises in an election Well, I think to, to answer the last part of your question, I think that what should be our policy is what has been our policy since 1972. And I think we should, or at least since the United States abrogated its treaty of a military alliance with Taiwan. You remember, we did have a military alliance with Taiwan. Uh, then we recognized the People's Republic, and we adopted the One China policy. Uh, I think that should be our policy. I don't think we should go back to a military alliance, and I don't. I think we should. Uh, I think Biden Biden's remarks are open to two interpretations. One is that they're just Bidenisms. I mean, classic talking off the cuff, and then his advisors having having to rush to clarify what he says. Or there's method in his madness. Uh, the other uh, the other interpretation, they're more calculated and deliberate. I suspect that there are there is an element of there has been an element of calculation. He, he wants to create a new perception in the mind of the Chinese. He wants to enhance American uh, deterrence against an attack. And I you know you could, there's an argument for doing that, but you have to be careful. It has to be accompanied by reassurance. It has to be accompanied. It should not be accompanied by, you know, ratcheting up pressure on Taiwan, restoring deterrence if it had been eroded, should not be accompanied by the declaration of economic war on China, you know, in the, in the same context, which we've done. I mean, it's, 
Uh, do, does the right hand know what the left hand is doing in Washington? I don't know. Um, it's a fascinating question. But I think the upshot, the, over, you know, the overall effect is, is that it's worrisome to, uh, to me. And the, the trend, uh, unless there is some an intention to, to engage China in a dialogue uh, in the future, one can only hope there is. By the way, if you're interested in this subject of, of semiconductor and the, on this unfolding issue, which is going to be more and more important, there's someone called John Bateman. And make a note of that, John Bateman at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, who has written some, some really interesting articles. And he's, he also does, uh, he writes for Foreign Policy magazine. John, please. Evan, I think your your question is is very important. Um, the the thing I would underscore is that China policy is actually one of the few areas of convergence, uh, both across the aisle in in the Senate and in the the House. Uh, and between the Senate and the House. So, so in that sense, you know, if Biden wants to do this, this rapprochement with, uh, with China, he's going to face stiff congressional opposition. I think, I think that's worth underscoring. Um, and, and to Hans's point earlier about whether she is ever going to buy into this vision, um, this congressional opposition is going to be quite important. Kevin McCarthy, when he takes over as Speaker of the House, has already made it clear he's going to make a visit to Taiwan. Um, and when he goes to visit Taiwan, there's going to be a lot of chest thumping, um, a lot more than Nancy Pelosi did. And that is just going to drive Xi around the bend. Uh, and, and so we need to be apprehensive. Uh, this economic warfare that John is talking about, let's not forget, Taiwan is one of the world's capitals for semiconductor manufacturing. Uh, and, and so the idea of taking Taiwan uh, by the Chinese government now becomes a solution to the economic warfare problem that the Biden administration is confronting them with. Um, and, and so how they do that and what kind of provocation there is, I, I think, is, is worth paying attention to. Um, and, and so I think these are, are, are super complicated. The other guy I would mention, in, in addition to Bateman, that's worth paying attention to is a guy called James Mann. Uh, who you will meet when you go to SICE next year, if you go to SICE in Washington. Uh, Jim is a scholar in residence uh, in Washington. He's one of uh, America's great writers on U.S.-China relations, was one of the original uh, L.A. Times journalists to go to China in the 1980s uh, and lived there for a while and has written a number of books, uh, including The China Fantasy, which is the, the idea that there could be this um, this easy rise of China without the kind of tensions that we're experiencing right now, which is one of the books uh, that has influenced the community of Sinologists in the United States uh, quite significantly. I'm no expert on semiconductors, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I have to, I will qualify what you said, what you just said, Eric, if I understand, there, is it, are there any semiconductor experts here? You should, if you want to invest in your future, you know, learn about semiconductors. Plastics. Yeah. <laughs> it used to be plastics. So. Anyway, um, it's true that Taiwan has this, makes a huge share of the world's advanced semiconductor. They, they, they have foundries there, which actually can produce stuff. What's the name of the company? TSMC, I think it is. Yeah. Right. But, but of course, that company relies on inputs from elsewhere in the world. It relies on, on supplies. It's a very complex supply chain. So if you, if you did seize Taiwan and those foundries, it wouldn't solve, entirely solve your problem since, since, those, since Taiwan is, that company is so dependent on technology and uh, inputs and designs from, uh, there's the Dutch company, which has a monopoly on the, lithography and us anyway so it wouldn't it wouldn't solve your problem overnight which is maybe that's good news in a way because the, the chinese did not, would not have the incentive to seize taiwan that, that you might think they did um so who else right, right here yeah i'm curious where this aggressive policy is coming from within the democrat post 
given the fact that once we talk about the economy is the most important, uh, one of the most important topics in the United States, it seems much of the Democrats can go about moving, um, preventing a trade war with China, especially right now, and given how the Democrats put so much emphasis on decarbonizing, the fact that China owns a majority share of cobalt processing and DRC, you know, raw material processing has you know, hypocrisy between Democrats trying to push decarbonization in the United States and you know, more dependent on the global economy that's that's driven by raw materials, while at the same time trying to basically put in trade incentives for China. It seems like they would be far better set to go ahead and try to meet the trade. Well, I'll take a quick shot at that question because it's really interesting. Uh, Where's John Kerry in all this, by the way? I mean, he's out there way, you know, he's a voice in the wilderness now. No one's listening to him in the administration. Uh, you know, he's their climate man, their climate czar, but he's been totally outshouted down by another, other groups of Democrats, including, well, you have the, you know, the traditional uh, union view and the Biden has tried to hold hew more closely to that view, which is very critical of China. It has been ever since U.S. manufacturing was basically wiped out in the first 10 years of, of this century. Uh, the U.S. lost uh, 6 million manufacturing jobs and 30, 35% of its manufacturing jobs, a largely or considerable degree because of Chinese competition and, and outsourcing as a result of Chinese competition. So you have a, a backlash at the, at the level of the unions and the working class, but you also have a group of people in um, intellectuals and China specialists, people like Kurt Camel, who was in the Obama administration, who had bought into the idea that China is going to change and we're going to, you know, we're going to convert China to capitalism and democracy, and who have now realized and decided that that was totally wrong and they have gone, the, you know, they've gone to the other extreme. It's like, you know, I was wrong and I, I was a communist and I became a, a right winger. It's it's sort of it's been a total overnight conversion, and they're they're driving this. And then you see you have a set of people in the Commerce Department and in the USTR who are interested in industrial policy, and you know in some ways imitating the Chinese model, ad adapting it to a, an American system, a mixed economy. So you have a, and then here's where Bateman is really interesting because he can spell this out much more. In much greater detail than I can. But you have a convergence. And then, of course, as Eric says, you have Congress beating the drum of the Republicans. So there's really no one pushing back. That's the problem right now. There's no one, there's no debate in Washington at the moment on China policy, a crucial, uh, it's like, the, you know, somebody has to, to start, uh, you know, trying to steer the, the ship away from the iceberg, if you ask me. But I don't know who it's going to be. May I voice an unpopular opinion again, just for a bit of diversity? Um, the um, I, the position towards China that the the Democrats you say are are also justifying is can also be argued to be justified. The China that we're dealing with right now is not the same China that we were dealing with uh, ten or twenty years ago. Uh, so she is definitely um, steering the ship towards a different position in terms of increased authoritarianism and population control and economy control and party control and uh, long-term legacy and so on. And this isn't something that can be dealt with with similar tools that we've been dealing with so far. Um, and second is the issue of human rights that has come to the fore in important ways and that the Democrats have taken um as well and been running with for their base um and it's not just the uyghurs but there are uh, many many other problems uh that uh that a lot of the, the the democrats and the people who are supporting the democratic party um are considered to be important so that i just want to put it out there that although we sh there is definitely a reason to be concerned about you know hitting the iceberg um that the the the, the mere identification of the iceberg having grown in proportion is also a good step uh, to, to trying to figure out what is what are the next um, uh, issues in policy that matter. Okay, that's an important point. I mean, you have expressed very well that in, in a way that the mainstream democratic view of China at the moment, there's a strong ideological element or concern about the 
the system. The question is whether the, the recipe uh, that, whether the medicine that the, that the uh, Biden administration is, is attempting to force down China's throat is gonna, is gonna do any good uh, when it comes to um, reducing or human rights abuses and so on. Uh, it seems to me there's a there's a there's a debate to be had to to. Uh, Can I say yeah. something like this? Yeah, sure. I think it's also you know the the domestic politics element of this. You know the the stuff that the Biden administration is doing to China right now actually fits very neatly within Xi's larger agenda. It justifies his change in economic strategy, the the global rebalancing that he's been trying to promote. It actually underscores the importance of the change in political strategy. I mean, I know that Sergei is much more expert on China than I am, but but for Xi, this has created an opportunity. So did so did Trump before this, right? And the continuity between the Trump administration and the Biden administration is shocking, right? Um, the <clears throat> so in that sense, I think we're we're seeing Xi cleverly exploit this situation, despite the fact that it does come at an economic cost. By the same token, the Biden administration is exploiting the opportunity that was created by COVID, right? I mean, if you think about what COVID did to global supply chain management and to awareness of how these global supply chains are structured, it made it easy for him to stick with the, the whole Lighthouser model of, of trying to shift supply chains out of China so that they run through other parts of Southeast Asia. And the more she has followed the zero COVID strategy, the the more easily the Biden administration is able to talk about friend shoring and all the rest, right? Because each supply chain disruption creates an opportunity and an incentive to, to re-engineer that global value chain away from China. So we're seeing these domestic agendas actually uh, actually pulling China and the United States apart uh, in opportunity structures that that if they didn't exist, we probably wouldn't see, right? Um, and, and so I, I think we have to be very attentive to this. And this is why I think the point that John makes about, you know, a rapprochement at some point in the future is an important one, because if China and the United States get too far apart in this, then the, the potential for violent conflict between the two, that would be the result of misunderstanding, poor signaling and all the rest, right, actually increases. And, and we really need to avoid that to the best of our abilities. And we're not doing a very good job at it right now. Last point, Kirk Campbell has the largest staff of any of the regional staffs at the NSC, right? He is driving, uh, in many respects, NSC policy. Um, and, and the people that I know who are China hands, Lee Miller runs this outfit called called uh, China Beige Book, the largest private data collection entity in China. And he meets often with these guys at the NSC. And what Lee tells me uh, is that there's no strategy. There's, a, you know, they, they've got a lot of people at the NSC, but they don't have a, 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 a real strategy for what to do with China. So what we're seeing and in trying to interpret as a strategy is actually just a, a series of discrete policy actions that don't really have a clear destination or motive that underpins them, right? Um, and, and I think we shouldn't underestimate that possibility and the, the real danger that that represents looking in the long term. Yeah, I suspect that that is true. <laughs> And there's really nobody in charge. Uh, there's no, there really isn't a coherent policy. Um, and in a way, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't ever Im imagine that I would ever say anything in, in favor of the Trump administration. But it seems to me they did have, and I'm talking in particularly about this guy, Lighthizer, who was a very serious character, a seasoned expert diplomat, and he was the USTR. I think he he did have a vision of what should happen. That you, yeah, you 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 really you bash the Chinese. You really get their attention. Uh, you hit them across the forehead with you know with a two by four. But then, you know, you engage them in a negotiation, a painful, extended, uh, imperfect, two steps forward, one step back. But the the ultimate aim is to find a way that uh, for these systems to coexist. Uh, in the context, in a basically a WTO context, you know what I mean. I mean there have to be rules that that everybody adheres to, and it seems to me that's that's what you need to go back to. At least you need to try that. 
uh, rather than throwing the WTO out the, out the window. That's what this administration has done. There's nothing here about, they have, they resort to this, there's a national security sort of, um, I forget what you call it. I mean, you can, you can invoke it to, to do just about anything you want. And that's what they have done. Uh, but I mean, who, who invented the WTO? Whose idea was it? It was our idea. I mean, who invented the idea of a liberal trading order? It was us. Now we're the ones who are, are, are flouting it. And, you know, as, as Veronica points out, you, there are many good reasons why, you know, you can't trust the Chinese and they're, they're doing terrible things. But it seems to me you still have to engage them. Um, especially at a time when, you know, when relations with Russia are what they are. You know, do you want to you want to push these two countries into each other's arms, which is what our what, what we have managed to do uh, to some extent anyway. Anyway, I'm off the soapbox. <laughs> so, and we, it's just about, we're just about out of time, but we do maybe one more question. Final word. Do I get the final word? Okay. Sergey, do you want the I'll, final I'll word? Throw in a question. Um, So I had a, uh, I'm, I'm very respectful of Anne's point that that prediction could be self fulfilling. So I don't want to, I don't want to make a self fulfilling prophecy. But I, but I will say something that a good buddy of mine uh, from uh, from Utah, who's since passed away tragically at far too early an age, Wade Jacoby, uh, said to me. Right? I mean, he he comes, he was from the LDS Church. He comes from a very conservative background, um, and and we were talking about what was going on and, and what was likely to happen in the future. And he looked at me and he said, you know, we've got a real serious problem on our hands uh, insofar as the police, um, many people who have military experience uh, and, <clears throat> and many people in the West are heavily armed, right? And it doesn't take a lot of people who are heavily armed uh, and well-trained to create disorder. Uh, and, and if you ever see those images of Kyle Rittenhouse uh, walking around with the with with a rifle, uh, and the fact that he is he's greeted by the police and not considered a threat uh, by the police immediately prior to to using that rifle to to actually take a human life, th this is an alarming prospect. Um, and so it's not a question of of do I think a civil war is possible in the United States? It's a question of. Uh, do I think that it is dangerous for us to have these polarized beliefs in the context of a society where people do not live with one another when they disagree, uh, and, and those people are supremely well-armed and good at using the arms they have available, right? Uh, I think that is a very bad situation. So when I see President Biden give speeches like the one he gave Yesterday, um, I think I think it's well intentioned. I think I understand the message that he's he's trying to make, but but unfortunately, framing it as an us versus them conversation is not actually helping to lower the degree of polarization. It's actually convincing half of America to, to close the shutters over their ears so that they don't have to listen uh, to what the president has to say. And I think that's a, a, a very scary prospect. Uh, does that solve? any of Putin's problems, the worst thing that could happen to Putin would be a civil war in the United States, uh, because any attempt by him to do anything would draw uh, immediate fire from all directions. And, and here again, think about, you know, Kevin McCarthy, who's 
who wants to one up Nancy Pelosi by poking the the panda bear. Um, this is just not n- not a smart way to do politics. Uh, but they would do that on steroids if we were in a real violent situation in the United States. I say the same thing about civil war in Russia. If there's a civil war in Russia, I think that's the worst thing that could happen to us. Uh, so I think we need to be careful on both sides of that relationship. So I I think that um, um, Eric's concerns with guns and so on is also due to the Texas background. Um, I want to add to this that it's it, it that is correct. The problem with the arms is definitely a, a thing that we can see in all the statistics and so on. But there's a larger problem. The majority of people who participated in the January 6th insurrection were not part of the military. Uh, They weren't uh, part of any of these militarized groups like uh, the Oath Keepers or Proud Boys. Uh, They were uh, CEOs, they were business people, they were uh, um, IT people, uh, mostly men, white, yes, uh, but they were not they were part of different, um, they, they came from all over the U.S., from counties where both Trump had won and uh, or um, uh, Biden had won, uh, mostly from urban areas, uh, and they were uh, getting their information from different uh, parts of the of the media. So it it is a much more widespread feeling that access to violence is at hand uh, than um, using the guns. And the um, idea of the civil war, I think that when we say civil war, we think of, uh, you know, 19th century or something that looks very, you know, one side is attacking another and so on. Uh, It will look like protests that will escalate in violence throughout the whole country. And the potential for that is there. So th- because you cannot localize these groups of people when you look at, at the at the makeup of who participated in the January 6th insurrection uh, in, in any particular areas. It's so widespread. Um, and um, and that's a big, big problem. You get the last word. OK, big problem. Uh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you.